Dr. Cotty gave me a thumbs up. Okay. Let's begin with the first case. Case number one, we have a shave biopsy. Right away, we notice that there's an uh, infiltrate and it appears to be an inflammatory process. As we're looking from top to bottom on this case, we notice that there's a wedge shape to this inflammation. We're seeing that it, it is somewhat top heavy. There's a lot more inflammation on the top of the specimen. And if you think about an upside down uh, triangle or pyramid, let's say, if you think in three dimensions, the apex is going uh, toward the, the base of the specimen or the deep margin. So it is wedge shaped and the process is somewhat nodular it's interstitial, it's diffuse. And when we look on low power, we notice that this is a, a lymphoid process and, but we're wondering what cell types are in this um, group, of, um, group of inflammation, you know, what type of cells are in here. We're seeing many, many lymphocytes on low power. But as we go up on higher power, we notice that there is mixed inflammation we're seeing lymphocytes that appear typical in appearance, and we're seeing some larger cells, some possible plasma cells. We're seeing also some cells that look appear to be eosinophils. So we do have a mixed population of cells with eosinophils. So right away, our index of suspicion for this being um, a lymphomatous process goes way down because the population is mixed and we see many, many eos. So when you see many EOs, you start to think about the possibility that this could represent some sort of uh, bug bite. And when you look in the stratum corneum, you might want to look for organisms and bugs, arthropods, or possibly even um, other entities such as larvae or other, other things. And right away, we see a little bit of spongiosis here in this area, but we don't really see a vesicle formation. We're not seeing any pustules. We're seeing some hyperkeratosis and some parakeratosis. So we haven't seen an organism. And then we looked at our trusty sheet and um, the dermatologist wanted a tick bite. And I think this fits very well for um, a tick bite, a process that's been induced by a tick bite because we're seeing many, many eosinophils. We're seeing these nodular proliferations and it's very top heavy. Um, even though we did not see the parts, we can definitely say that this process is consistent with the tick bite. Um, and we def definitely favor a benign process here. Um, if we stain this, we would probably see a mixed population of, of cells that are staining for T uh, cell markers such as CD3 and B cell markers such as CD20. So the population would be mixed if we stained it, but we wouldn't even need to stain this because we see so many eosinophils in this process. What I would like to see is some germinal centers that are appearing normal with maybe some tingible bodies, uh, macrophages with, but I don't see any of that. I didn't see good germinal centers here. And I looked in the dermis for mouth parts very, very carefully. But what I notice about this process is there is some fibroplasia in the dermis, which makes you think about a chronic long-standing lesion that's been there for quite a while. So with all of that, I think we can say that this was consistent with a tick bite. And the reason I'm showing this to you is this is that monocytoid appearance to the proliferation that you sometimes hear about that can mimic a lymphomatous process. So would I say this is a pseudo-lymphomatous? You could say that. A lot of authors don't like to use that term, but I think it's fine. I think it's fine to say this is a pseudo-lymphomatous process. But when you see, again, the mixed population of cells and that the cells are very typical, the other thing you note is there's absolutely no epidermotropism. You're not seeing many plasma cells. If you thought about a process such as syphilis, you'd see a lot more um, histiocytes and a lot more plasma cells. But if you were worried about syphilis, you certainly could uh, put an immunohistochemical stain on this process. Um, I didn't, that wasn't the first thing I thought about when I saw this process. This isn't very psoriasiform, it's acanthotic and we're not seeing um, a good psoriasiform um, hyperplasia here. So I didn't see a very good Bren zone either. Um, there really isn't much else to say other than the salivary secretions of these ticks. And this was most likely a dog tick or dermacenter. Um, you know, typically with Lyme disease, you won't see a wedge-shaped infiltrate. And in the leading edge of Lyme, like the ECM, the erythema chronica migraines, 
you'll see more plasma cells in the leading edge. And that's when you can do your Steiner stain or your um, Worth and Starry stain. So um, you wouldn't think about right off the bat that this was uh, a tick by, by Ixoides. And I wouldn't probably use a Steiner stain on this. They weren't thinking about Ixoides, um, the hard tick. This is probably more of a derma center that uh, bit this patient. And sometimes the surgeon will cut this out or the dermatologist will cut this out to get all the mouth parts out because this reaction will just persist and you'll have this nodule for quite a long time. I actually have experience, personal experience with Lyme. I did catch Lyme. I, I got bit by a tick on Long Island uh, many, many years ago and caught it in the very acute stages. I did get the classic ECM. It migrated out after the initial tick bite, which looked somewhat targetoid. Um, it migrated out in like the classic ECM look. And I remember coming back to my fellowship here in Texas at UT and um, Dr. Crockle was joking that they were gonna do a biopsy on me and to see if they could do the Steiner stain and see if they could find the spirochetes. Um, so to summarize this tick bite, we have a superficial and deep lymphocytic infiltrate with scattered EOs. Also, there's a monocytoid appearance to the infiltrate. And we see many, um, um, you may see arthropod parts and we did not see that here. These salivary secretions may produce this nodular somewhat pseudolymphomatous response. And there's a dense perivascular response of neutrophils, lymphocytes, plasma cells, histocytes, and EOs. We didn't see many newts. Usually you'll see that pustule right beneath the, uh, the mouth part. You might see that pustule. Um, with ECM, again, you'll have a different appearance, except in the center where the tick bite is actually occurring. Typically with ECM and the leading edge, you'll see many more plasma cells and you won't see as much of a nodular infiltrate. Usually you don't, you'll just see plasma cells in a perivascular location. And then you can do your Steiner stain or Worth and, Worth and Starry. I've actually been having good luck with the T-PAL stain, the T-Palatum for uh, syphilis because uh, it's an immunohistochemical stain and it stains the spirochetes of syphilis. And it does, there have been papers showing that it can cross react with the organisms in um, Lyme. So if the Steiner and the Worth and Starry don't work very well because they're special stains as opposed to immunohistochemical stains, I will do that stain and see if I can find the organisms that way. I mean, it's worth a try if there's a high index of suspicion for Lyme disease because we don't have an immunohistochemical stain specifically for Borrelia. All righty, next case. Oh, we have a beautiful nodule here. And this is a shave biopsy, but the, the lesion is somewhat dome shaped. Oops, a whole 365 degree. And we, it's somewhat polypoid, you know, but it's dome shaped and polypoid. And right away on low power, we're thinking about, oh, could this be a basal cell carcinoma? Is this a nodular cystic type? And the answer is, ah, no, be careful, be very careful, because we're not seeing mucinous areas here. We're not seeing connection to the epidermis, but yet we're seeing this collarette, which is making us think that this lesion arose here, um, because this collarette indicates to me that it has time to grow around the nodule. That means the nodule probably arose here. It's probably not a met. And it's so closely associated with the epidermis here that um, I right away, I thought on low power, could this be basal? But it's very, very basophilic, very, very basaloid. And it's got that small blue cell tumor look. But then I'm seeing central areas of necrosis that's giving it this cystic degeneration look. It's actually if you look at very closely, this is geographic necrosis. This is actually tumor necrosis in the center of these nodules, these large nests. Um, the other thing, again, I'm searching very hard for any changes atop this. I'm looking for things like melanoma in situ. I'm looking for things like uh, an aggregate arising off of this epidermis. I'm looking for squamous cell carcinoma in situ. I'm looking for AK. I'm looking for any clues. And this is a budding the epidermis, but it doesn't appear to be coming directly off of it. So I don't see the attachment here. Also, as I'm looking at this tumor, I'm checking these capillaries and I'm checking any lymphatics in this uh, dermis to see, sometimes you can't tell capillaries from lymphatics, but I'm looking to see and assuming maybe this might be a lymphatic. Um, and I'm looking to see, are the tumor emboli I mean, are the, is the, are the tumor cells forming emboli inside these vessels? So I'm looking for angiolymphatic invasion. 
um, to see um, is this tumor coming or going? I mean, is this going to metastasize to a lymph node or is it coming from another part of the body? So, and, and a, uh, coming out of the vessel and then growing in this spot. So I'm checking these vessels very carefully as I'm looking at the epidermis. I'm seeing the hyperkeratosis and I'm saying, well, there's hypergranulosis. Maybe they were rubbing this nodule on their skin. So this may be indicative of rubbing, which is why you're getting a thickening of, the, of this layer, the keratin layer. And we know when we look on low power, we know where we are because we see this follicle. So we know we're on hair bearing skin. Um, also, you wanna look at the epidermis on the sides of this lesion. And if you look at the edges, does it really have an infiltrative border? Not really, it is somewhat well circumscribed, but you're getting a host response of these lymphocytes. Also, you wanna study the lymphocytes adjacent to it. Use the clues on the slide to help you during the test. If you're like, wait a minute, could this be a lymphoma? Notice the cells are clumping together. And if you look at the normal lymphocytes nearby, it's somewhat discohesive. They're, you notice these cells are separate and distinct from each other. There's discohesion in this group of lymphoid cells, um, this host response. And you look at the tumor cells here, they seem to be clumped together. And when you look on higher power, they are clumped and you're seeing the cell, many mitoses, that's what's striking uh, here. There are many, many mitoses. There are very high NC ratios. The cells are small to intermediate in size. Um, you don't see prominent nucleoli, which steers you away from thinking that this could be a melanoma. I like to see a prominent nucleolus with melanoma. Um, also, you see a little more discohesion with melanoma of the cells. These cells are clumping together like a carcinoma. And when you look at the chromatin pattern of these cells, they do appear somewhat stippled, meaning that you're seeing areas where they look vesicular, where they have somewhat of a bubbly look. When I say vesicular, I mean bubbly. And other areas, you'll see a couple of nucleoli, like this cell here. So you have three small nucleoli, not big red eye nucleoli, like you see with some melanomas. Um, so, and you don't see any melanin here. So you're really saying to yourself, I don't think this is a melanoma, highly unlikely. It does have a very high mitotic rate. Um, and you don't see the palisade, you don't see any mucin. And the, uh, also the way the cells are molding is very, very important. The cells are molding, meaning my fist and cupping around my hand. That's what I think of when I think of molding. It's sort of slightly, one cell is slightly curling around another cell. So that's, and you'll see that with some of these cells. Plus this chromatin, some people say it looks like a clock face. I don't buy into that. Um, I think of that more for plasma cells, but you know, they're saying with these little dots around it, you it's sort of like stippled and, um, but right away with that stippled chromatin, I think about a neuroendocrine differentiation. This doesn't look like a carcinoid because the, the NC ratios are way too high. Um, so I would want to stain this and I would want to stain it for things like neuroendocrine markers, synaptophysin chromogran and CD56. Um, also the INSM1 is very, very good because it has more sensitivity and specificity for the uh, neuroendocrine cells than um, the synaptophysin chromogran, which can sometimes be very weak and lead you astray. So I did put an INSM1 on it, which is a nuclear marker. Um, so when it stains positive, it stains nuclear. And we have very strong and diffuse positive staining here, uh, probably a four plus out of four. Um, the staining is very strong on these nuclei. So now we know there's neuroendocrine differentiation. And once we realize there's neuroendocrine differentiation, we then have to decide, could this potentially be coming from, could this be coming uh, a small cell carcinoma of the lung? Could this be a large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma of the lung? Could this be coming from the GI tract? Uh, could this be a primary neuroendocrine carcinoma of skin? Um, and so we go through the differential in our head. So I could sign this out right now as neuroendocrine carcinoma, but then I would get a phone call from, from the doctors asking me, is this a primary or secondary? And then I would need to give them a further um, answer. You know, I'd have to tell them, I'd have to give them more information. The other thing is there is a stain you can do a CK20 and you can look for um, the perinuclear dot but there rarely some lung uh, primaries can have that as well. So you can't use it 100% to say it's primary neuroendocrine carcinoma of the skin when you see that dot on the CK20 stain. 
So you can't say that 100%. So you can't use it entirely. So that's why when I have a, a, a Merkel cell or a neuroendocrine carcinoma, I would then do an additional stain. So here we have another case that has a similar appearance, but it's not as, uh, it's not as uh, polypoid. It is very much ulcerated. It was on the head and neck of a 75-year-old um, patient. You're seeing some severe sun damage. So we know we're on sun-exposed skin. We know we're on hair-bearing skin. We also see this area of crust, scale crust, and there's area of ulceration here where the epidermis is denuded. And in this edge here, we're seeing infiltration. On this peripheral edge, it becomes more trabecular in appearance in this, this case, but most of this are sheets of cells and a very, very high um, cellularity to this uh, process. And it looks very similar to the prior process, but it doesn't have those areas of geographic um, necrosis and that nodular look to it that mimics so nicely a basal cell. Um, here we have, again, a very similar chromatin pattern. We have very little cytoplasm and the cytoplasm we see is, has minimal cytoplasmic borders, if any, and you see amphiphilic cytoplasm, which it means it picks up a little bit of the eosin and a little bit of the hematoxylin. This high mitotic rate should tip you off right away that this is in a basal cell. So if you get panicked on the test and you go on high power and you start seeing lots of mitoses, but you don't see big nucleoli, start thinking about neuroendocrine differentiation. And if you don't know what vesicular chromatin is, you forgot about the bubbly aspect of it, um, you can always look for the stippling of the chromatin and the molding, that's so important, the molding where the cells sort of wrap around each other trying to find a good cell that depicts that. But it's the way they're pushing up against each other and they're, they're leaning up and they're sort of rounding around each other. Um, here we have an, the next stain, which um, this was our CK20. And on this stain, I would look for that dot. And I do see areas where I'll see a little dots. And then some areas, this is a cytoplasmic stain, the CK20. And um, I do see an occasional dot here and there. So I'm seeing dots. So that's making me think, okay, this is probably primary neuroendocrine carcinoma of the skin. One more stain to help me really say it's consistent with Merkel cell carcinoma is the last stain I would do is this TTF, the thyroid transcription factor one. Now you're thinking, why are you doing a TTF, a thyroid transcription factor one when we're looking we're trying to figure out if it's coming from the lung or the GI tract. Well, this, they found out that this stain, um, it's also known as NKX2 or thyroid specific enhancer binding protein. They found out that it actually um, uh, stains for small cell carcinoma of the lung and some of the larger cell neuroendocrine carcinomas will stain with it. And rarely the adeno will too, so of the lung. So being that this is negative, it's not coming from the lung. The patient has no history of a GI mass, and you can honestly say it's consistent with primary neuroendocrine carcinoma of the skin, Merkel cell carcinoma. So, and on electron microscopy, don't forget, you see the dense core on neurosecretory granules because they love to test you on that. So uh, we pretty much ran through the, uh, the Merkel cell. You have the basophilic cells arranged in irregular aggregates, cords and strands in the dermis. Many of the cells so, show the nuclear molding and mitoses, abundant mitoses. Always check for the angiolymphatic invasion. Areas may resemble, you may see areas that resemble SEC, BCC, eccrine ducts, leiomyosarc, uh, atypical fibroxanthoma. You might see some pagetoid spread, and it could be entirely intraepidermal. You can see a Merkel cell that's intraepidermal. Um, that's somewhat rare, but if you see different uh, differentiation on the stain, the area that's looking like an AFX might not stain with the neuroendocrine marker. So there you have, um, when you have to mention that in your report if you do see those different areas in the tumor. Merkel cell carcinoma, again, the metastatic small cell from the lung, you'll do the TTF, the NSE. Um, the nonspecific um, enolase, the chromogranin, the synaptophysin stain. You can do the CK20, which could be plus or minus with a MET small cell. So watch out. It's not 100% that paranuclear um, uh, globule or dot. 
The CEA can be positive half the time and the argentafin stain, which is a silver stain that's positive with metastatic small cell from the lung. Metastatic small cell from the GI tract, you'll definitely start to see argentafin positive stain. Um, your TTF is usually um, and, uh, positive. It's usually positive. Occasionally it can be. Um, metastatic carcinoid, again, the cells will look totally different. You'll see a lot more cytoplasm. You won't see as many mitoses, but your NSC will be positive and your CA, CEA will be positive. Your, your carcinoembryonic antigen will be positive half the time. And if you do think it's a lymphoma, you can always put the LCA on the um, tumor and the LCA should be negative in a um, Merkel cell. And this chart really summarizes all of it. The other thing you do have to add to your differential, you, if you do think it's a BCC, you can always do the CK7, which can be plus or minus, and the CAM 5.2. If you think it's a BCC, you could also try the BEAR EP4, but BEAR EP4 can sometimes stain Merkel's. So it's not helpful. You really have to rely on your histology to rule out uh, the basal um, and then get down your pathway to doing the stain. So you have to be very careful with basals when you're signing out at a rapid speed, not to miss a Merkel cell. You really have to look at the cytology of almost every basal because you can have uh, a Merkel cell sneak in there. We're seeing about six of them a month here, Merkel cells. So in a PNET, a peripheral neural ectodermal tumor, you'll definitely see the CD99 positivity, very rare in the skin. I have seen them in the testicular area. And then there's Ewing sarcoma, which will also stain with CD99. Again, a squamous cell, if you think about a poorly differentiated squamous, which has absolutely no differentiation, almost undifferentiated, you might want to put the CK5-6 on it, and that will help you lead to, uh, tell you if it's a poorly differentiated squame. Let's say your neuroendocrine markers are all negative. Um, ADNO, again, you could try the CEA. You could try um, the CK7, and 20 might help you. Um, but uh, again, you'll look for glandular differentiation in that tumor. Um, let me go back. Oh, I missed the slide. So I guess you got a little peek at what's next. Um, we have a shave biopsy. This is somewhat of a papular lesion. Um, this lesion was on the, uh, the face, I believe. The patient was younger um, in their 30s. I think 30 is young. So. Uh, but um, what we notice right away is we see that this process is coming off the epidermis. Um, we notice that there's a lot of um, increase in the keratin layer here. We also notice that some of the cells in this area that are coming off the epidermis, there is a palisade, and we notice that there's some clear, uh, clearness to the cells, a paleness compared to the, uh, keratin, uh, the uh, squamous cells above. We notice that some of these keratinocytes are... Um, much paler. So this is the beginning of the tumor here. And this palisade on the edge is very characteristic of this tumor. And if you look in certain areas, you can imagine the thickening of the basement membrane here. Um, and again, you have this, these columns coming off of the epidermis. And the reason we talk about this entity all the time is because we don't want to confuse this with a malignancy. We don't want to overcall this as a malignancy. You notice there's this uh, fibrovascular stroma, there's some inflammation, and it's a very busy slide. And right away, when you see this central area here, you get concerned because you see islands of cells and you're saying, wait a minute, there's this sclerosis down here. Is this desmoplasia around a tumor? And could this be a squamous cell carcinoma? But then you notice the differentiation here with these glycogenated cells and this palisade and the basement membrane. And you're saying, this doesn't look like a basal cell up here because there's no retraction. There's absolutely no mucin. And we notice that the cells look very bland and benign histologically. Even these cells down here that have this sclerotic stroma look very bland. In fact, I wanna get a slide that's in better focus. This slide is not in good focus for some reason when it was imaged. Let me find a better one. See if this one will be better. No, nope, that one's worse. I guess this one's as good as it's going to get. Nope, that's worse. I guess it's as good as it's going to get. So you'll have to trust me that there were no mitoses and the cells had lots of cytoplasm and they're tiny. They're very small and the sclerosis down here. And 
I don't notice any papillomatosis atop this. So when I see the palisade and the glycogenated cells are somewhat clear, and I see this area of desmoplasia or sclerosis, I start to think about a tricholomoma. Um, and I think about the desmoplastic variant of a tricholomoma. Um, come on in. I'm in the middle of a lecture. I don't know. I'll have to check that. I'll check it later. So going over tricholomoma a desmoplastic type, there is a lobular proliferation of the polygonal cells with clear or pale cytoplasm that extends into the dermis. And because it's endophytic, we can confuse it with a malignancy. But when you see the peripheral palisade and the thick basement membrane, and in the central portion of lesion, you can see the sclerotic stroma surrounding the small epithelial nests and strands. If you have doubt still, you can put a CD34 on the tumor, uh, this little neoplasm. And um, you, if it's positive, that can definitely lean you toward a tricholomoma. You're, it, typically, you'll see it on the face, scalp, neck, chest, the vulva area. Very rarely, you can see it in that area. And this desmoplastic tricholoma, usually it's solitary, and you, it's usually not associated with cowdens. You know, with cowdens, you'll see the multiple tricholomomas. And um, so this desmoplastic variant isn't usually associated with that. Um, if you think it is a BCC because you see the peripheral palisade and it coming off the undersurface and you only have a shave of the top of it, you can um, do the CD34 and it should be negative with the basal cell. Um, in general, tricholomomas are benign. They believe they're, they're benign uh, coming from the hair root sheath and the lobules can be oriented around a central follicle in a regular tricholomoma. And there's no mucinous stroma, there's no retraction, or you'd think about a basal cell. The surface can be somewhat verrucous, and that's where we get the, um, the diagnosis of the tricholomal wart, which is an acrimonian term. Usually I like to see more uh, papillomatosis when I call a tricholomal wart. Otherwise, we call it a tricholomoma. Occasionally, you can see a cutaneous horn atop a tricholomoma. So keep that in mind when you're taking off a horn that that might be in your differential, especially if you think it's endophytic. Um, mitoses are usually absent. And you can, you know, they're almost exclusively on the face. So nose, eyelids, um, lips, oral, oral around the oral cavity, um, usually in adults. And um, a tricholomoma, if there are multiple lesions on the face, you do think about Cowden's disease. The differential diagnosis, do consider inverted follicular keratosis, which some people think is a variant of a seborrhea keratosis. With an inverted follicular keratosis, I like to see more whorls, squamous eddies or squamous whorls. Um, in, you know, so that's a very important, but it is somewhat arbitrary in inverted follicular keratosis versus a tricholomoma. There's a, there's a lot of arbitrariness uh, to that. Um, with basal cell, you'll see retraction and um, mitoses, um, and you'd have to have more of the clear cell variant because we have those glycogenated cells in a tricholomoma. Um, a tumor of the follicular of in, infundibulum, you have that plate-like growth where it's parallel to the epidermis. You won't see mitosis and you won't see retraction. And a seborrheic keratosis, you'll see more horn cysts and the bottom will be more flat as opposed to rounded and sort of diving in to the dermis um, or pushing into the dermis is a better term. Um, clear cell acanthoma, more psoriasiform hyperplasia. You'll see, and, and you'll see neutrophil exocytosis with clear cell acanthoma. And this is a statement that comes out of Silverberg. It says the histologic limits between inverted follicular keratosis and tricholomoma are not sharply defined. Both lesions have the same anatomic distribution, although inverted follicular keratosis is more common in the periorbital area and tricholomoma favors the nasal area or the perioral area. Patterns of tricholomoma and inverted follicular keratosis are frequently combined and the assignment of a given lesion to one or the other is often arbitrary. I mean, that's kind of my mantra. I believe that. <laughs> I think it's arbitrary, but uh, I do look for the whorls and that's really important to look for the squamous whorls and the squamous eddies. The next case is a punch biopsy, case number five. Um, this is an interesting uh, lesion. Right away, we notice that the paniculus is, seems to be uninvolved in this process. We notice that the process involves the upper dermis 
and to the mid and somewhat into the lower dermis um, and the paniculus is spared. Um, we notice too that there's overlying um, increase in the keratin layer. We can even see it from this power. And we notice that the process is lichenoid, it's patchy lichenoid, it's interface. We see it uh, crashing into the, the epidermis here. And we also notice that um, it's definitely around and involving the mid to lower portion of this follicle in the area of where the sebaceous lobules are located. As we go on higher power, we might wanna notice um, how this infiltrate is looking as it gets closer to the dermoepidermal junction. We do notice some vacuolization at the junction. So when we see this vacuolization, and it is subtle, and we see the involvement around the follicles, we need to start to think about autoimmune processes um, such as lupus erythematosus and dermatomyositis. And when we see involvement around the follicle, our index of suspicion moves away from dermatomyositis because typically it doesn't involve the annexal structures. We also see hyperkeratosis, and that's an important finding. We are seeing some parakeratosis in this area. And we notice that there isn't any neoplastic process occurring. Always check for a neoplastic process on the epidermis because you can get inflammation because there's a neoplastic process. So as you're approaching your slide from a top down and you started and you noticed that the keratin layer was increased, you notice that these cells are maturing in a normal fashion. You can see the spinous layer, you can see the granular layer and maybe the granular layer is slightly increased. Um, so you're saying there's no neoplasm here. And we have, again, an inflammatory process that's around the vessels. If we look at the infiltrate, it's lymphohistiocytic. We don't see many eosinophils and always look for eosinophils when you have an inflammatory process. We also notice that there are no fungal organisms. We don't see any fungal organisms, which you can see on H&E and always check that very quickly on your test. Look in these follicles for fungal organisms. They like to throw that at you and give you something that will mimic a process that's superficial and deep, perivascular and perifollicular. So lupus is at the top of our differential. And if you look on higher power, right away you need to check for mucin. If you start thinking about lupus, check for mucin. Eh, could this be solar? Could this be a little mucin? I'm not sure. I could stain it. Or I could say, well, maybe, maybe there's a little mucin in there. I could say maybe, or maybe it's just the lab staining process. Also check your paniculus look for any involvement of the paniculus. And I don't see anything. I don't see a, a paniculitity going on down here. So this does have the appearance of lupus erythematosus. I would then maybe suggest direct immunofluorescence, but more importantly, serologic studies, because less than half of these will stain with immunofluorescence. And if it's negative, it doesn't disprove that this is lupus. So. Um, if you want to jump to the lupus band test, um, you know, you, you don't, we, we don't use it as often as we used to in the past, because at least at this lab, we're finding that it doesn't, it stains less than half the time. So um, lupus erythematosus, again, this is what it was. You did see the hyperkeratosis. We didn't really see atrophy there, but we did see the vacuolar degeneration, the basal cells. We saw some perivascular and perifollicular lymphocytic infiltrates, mostly lymphocytic infiltrates, a few scattered histiocytes, and dermal mucinosis was plus minus. Again, we'd want to correlate this with the serologic and possibly the DIF findings. This um, now we're going to discuss the types of lupus, discoid uh, lupus erythematosus. Can you tell them apart histologically? Uh, it can be very, very difficult, and there's tons and tons of overlap between them. So if you get lupus erythematosus as a diagnosis, and you're like, I want my pathologist to tell me what type this is, so I know what to do next, you might not always get that. And as it is so difficult to call these cases, um, we sometimes do not subtype it, and you still have to look for systemic involvement on each and every one of these as you get that diagnosis because you don't wanna miss systemic involvement. So the face, scalp, and ears can be involved in discoid lupus, but I will tell you some of the features that help differentiate them. So you just have, for the test, you know that um, you could have interface dermatitis with discoid lupus. You could, you'll have usually less ep epidermal atrophy than subacute. 
and you'll have occasional acanthosis and you can have a prominent basement membrane. On our last case, the basement membrane was focally thickened. Um, we didn't see a ton of plugging. When I see plugging, I don't like to see any basket weave. I like to see the keratin very compact and actually expanding the follicle slightly. Um, the infiltrate that we had was dense, superficial, and deep perivascular and periadnexal. I was leaning toward a more discoid type here, but sometimes you just really can't tell. Um, dermal fibrosis, you can see that more with the discoid type. You'll see a little more scarring. Um, and 90% you'll see IgA, DIF is in the active lesions only. So um, if they're not an active lesion, you'll see a less of an opportunity for that DIF to stain. The patients um, can be ANA negative. Uh, subacute cutaneous lupus, you'll see more of a super basal lymphocytic exocytosis. So when you start to see a little bit of exocytosis and dyskeratotic cells extending into the upper spinous layers, think more about the subacute type. And that is the key feature. There could be more atrophy. There's minimal absent plugging, absent basement membrane thickening, very minimal. And you can have a mild to moderate mononuclear infiltrate confined to the superficial dermis. 40% can be DIF positive, again, a very low number, which is why we're moving away from doing that, um, that test. And 50% are ANA positive, 70% can have anti-Rho and SSA. Systemic lupus, again, the infiltrate is more sparse. You'll have minimal epidermal atrophy. The basement membrane will appear more normal. You won't see much plugging and you can have prominent papillary dermal edema and reticular dermal mucin. Um, the normal and the lesional skin can be positive for DIF and patients have ANA positivity. Consider always the drug-induced lupus-like eruption. So if you do get lupus as a diagnosis, think about drug-induced uh, lupus erythematosus-like eruptions. The histology resembles, um, the DIF and histology re resemble SLE for the methyl dopa, the procainamide, quinidine, and the chlorprosamine and the hydralazine. Those drugs will look more like SLE, whereas the subacute will look more like the calcium channel blockers. So I have appearance that will resemble more the subacute. Eosinophils and epithelial granulomas may be present with the drug-induced. And the proof is that this is a drug-induced lupus erythematosus. Well, just remove the drug and then the lesions will clear up. So that's how you prove it. Our next case is also a punch biopsy. Um, right away, it looks like this is an inflammatory process. We have this papular lesion and we have this very pale area here. It looks somewhat strange because the way it's sort of pa uh, papular in appearance. So this appears to be some kind of uh, more important morphology here. Right away, we notice as we go from the top of the slide to the bottom of the slide that there's hyperkeratosis we notice there's some epidermal thinning and atrophy. We can't find any uh, nexal structures. It's just this one. We should see, all right, two, but we should see more than that. Um, there seems to be a skipped area here where we should have a follicle and we don't have any. Um, so we have this sort of edematous process that's somewhat homogenous. It's not very sclerotic. It must be a, a somewhat of a early to mid in the process of this lesion's uh, evolution. And we see um, this band of inflammation that's mostly lymphocytic beneath this homogenized area that's edematous. Also on higher power, we notice that this does not appear to be an actinic keratosis. It appears to have some basal or vacuolar degeneration. And if I look very carefully, the melanocytes are decreased, which may explain why this lesion had somewhat of a white appearance to it. Um, also, I noticed the vessels are somewhat ectatic. And right away, I want to look at the fibroblasts. There's scattered inflammatory cells in here. And I want to look at the fibroblasts. And the fibroblasts appear to be normal. They don't have a bizarre stellate shape or vacuoles in the cytoplasm. So I'm not thinking about radiation. If it was radiation, it would be going from side to side. So this does, it is very reminiscent of lichen sclerosis. And when I see lichen sclerosis, I always check to see if the inflammation is going further down deeper. And I see a lot of fat down here. So this is not morphia. I see fat down in the deep dermis and around the adnexal structures and the eccrine units. So, and this uh, 
this collagen does not look dense. So that leaves me with this sclerotic area above with this, this uh, tri-layered appearance. And um, I'm thinking about lichen sclerosis, but it seems to be a different variant, maybe a papular variant of this, which may not be in a genital location. It may be in an extra genital location. So this was lichen sclerosis at atrophicus. So we see a hyperkeratosis, epidermal atrophy, vacuolar change in the basal layer, some homogenization of the collagen and in edema. And as the lesion gets later and later, it becomes more and more sclerotic. As it's earlier and earlier, we may just see a band of inflammation and we might confuse it with lichen planus. So the earlier in the lichen sclerosis that we are, earlier in the evolution of the lesion, it can look similar to lichen planus. The only thing with lichen planus, you're gonna see hypergranulosis. So if you're getting confused between an early lesion of lichen sclerosis, which they love to give you on your test, and lichen planus, look for that, hypergran that wedge-shaped hypergranulosis in the epidermis, you know, the Wickham stria. Um, you may follow, um, oh, okay, so they may coexist with other skin conditions, um, lichen uh, simplex chronicus, so you could have lichen sclerosis with overlying rubbing, you could have psoriasis, you could have an erosive lichen planus with lichen sclerosis, vitiligo and morphia, they can coexist with other skin conditions, keep that in mind. And uh, the patient may have a personal history of an autoimmune disease, thyroid disease, pernicious anemia, or alopecia areata. Again, lichen sclerosis, you see it on the vulva area, the penis. There can be associated with phimosis, like balanitis, um, xerotica obliterans, um, perianal area in the groin. So, and your extra gen uh, genital locations, upper trunk, lower back, neck, arm, wrist, forehead, inner thigh, buttocks, under breast, shoulder, axilla. If it's not in the groin, consider morphia with LS features. You see less inflammation and edema in older lesions and more sclerosis. In earlier lesions, you'll see a band of inflammation. Um, the loss of the adnexa, you can see that, that's common. Hyperkeratosis is common. The superficial dermis is replaced by pale homogenized hyaluronized collagen and collagen bundles are lost. Very slow. Might have to skip to the next slide. All right. The differential for lichen sclerosis, think about when you're on the penis plasma cell balanitis, but you're gonna have greater than 50% plasma cells. You will have lymphocytes in the upper dermis. So it will be lichenoid with plasma cell balanitis. So you have to rule that out when you get lichen sclerosis on, on, on that area. Lichen planus, you're gonna see hypergranulosis. That's the big clue that it's lichen planus and not lichen, early lichen sclerosis. So early lichen sclerosis, again, can simulate lichen planus. Morphia, sclerosis of the reticular dermis and subcutis may also be present with lichen sclerosis. Don't forget that and look for that on your test. Lichenoid drug eruption, you're going to see EOs. You're going to see EOs. Hopefully, that'll help you. And the interface changes and an occasional necrotic keratinocyte. Radiation dermatitis, you've got to look for those stellate fibroblasts or so the pleomorphic fibroblasts. That is the key feature and an increase in the capillaries. Sometimes you'll see, and maybe some endothelial atypia occasionally. Radiation dermatitis, we had a case in Zola Cooper, but we had tons of dystrophic calcifications. So sometimes you could see dystrophic calcifications, radiation dermatitis. Amyloid, you're gonna see, well, if it's macular amyloid, it's gonna be macular. If it's lichen amyloid, it's gonna be in a lichenoid, uh, lichenoid uh, line. Amyloid that's nodular will have the nodules and they'll have a cracked appearance. But if you have a doubt whether it's amyloid or, or it's the homogenization of lichen sclerosis, you can do a Congo red stain and see if it's uh, get the apple green bifurfringens, spirofringens on your polarized light. Um, melanoma, you got to see some junctional component. And if you have a doubt, you can always put a SOX10 if you think it's a regressed area and a melanoma and it's sclerotic looking, then please do the SOX10 because you don't want to miss uh, MIS. And mycosis von goides, usually don't see that in the genital area. But again, you're going to see poitrias microapsises. You're going to see epidermotropism. You might see some atypia to the cells. If it's further progressed, you'll see cerebriform uh, nuclei, which uh, is a more progressed lesion of, of cutaneous T-cell lymphoma.
next case is this huge nodule that's broken up into three pieces. We have a nodule, we don't have any uh, attached epidermis. Um, this nodule is very sclerotic. We're seeing eosinophilia. And when you see this much eosin, you always think, well, this is very sclerotic. And it is, you have dense collagen there. But the thing that catches your eye are these darker eosinophilic areas that are surrounded by some inflammation. And they seem to be very busy in this area. Um, and over here, I really wanna look at these two because these two look somewhat classic. And this is your classic um, histiocytes that are in a palisaded arrangement. Some people might say, well, I gotta look for infection here. I've gotta look to see if there's organisms in here. But with this palisade and these histiocytes that are somewhat foamy and this fibrinoid uh, central area of um, necrobiosis, um, I'm thinking about more of things like subcutaneous granuloma annulari and things like rheumatoid nodules, especially with this subcutaneous nodule here um, with these multiple areas. Um, I don't see any of the normal structures um, from this um, extensor surface. I'm not seeing any tendon or anything like that um, in this slide. Because what you want to do in a test is try to figure out where you are. And figuring out you're in the subcutis is very, very important. That This is a subcutaneous nodule that's somewhat well circumscribed. But getting on higher power and you're seeing this palisade and it's very eosinophilic. You don't see mucin here. This fibrinoid uh, area, these are uh, fibrin really, you start to think about a rheumatoid nodule. I mean, it's, it's a slam dunk if it's on the extensor surface. Um, we didn't even stain this. So um, you can pretty much call this a rheumatoid nodule. So when you have it in the lower dermis and subcutis and the fibrinoid necrosis surrounded by the palisaded histiocytes and there's a perivascular lymphoplasma acidic, you like to look for plasma cells in rheumatoid nodules, because that's one of the clues that it's a rheumatoid nodule. You'll see some plasma cells. The center necrosis lacks the basophilic mucin seen in GA. So you really have to rely on that, that it's not a subcutaneous GA. Um, also location, location, location on the body. Um, so scattered neutrophils you can see in the center of the granulomas. 20% um, of the patients have RA. Some of them can even have SLE, the ulnar border of the forearm, the back of the hand, the elbow, the knuckles, the Achilles tendons, and the foot are common locations for this rheumatoid nodule. Rheumatoid nodule, the differential, includes the neutrophilic palisaded granulomas derm. Um, typically with that, you'll have a history of RA. You'll see more neutrophils, leukocytoclasia, LSC is variable. Um, typically you'll see, you can see basophilic colla uh, collagen necrosis and the superficial and deep perivascular and interstitial infiltrated lymphocytes, PMNs and macrophages. The epidermis is typically normal, usually seen in RA or occasionally SLE, leukemia, lymphoma, vasculitis, Sjord-Strauss syndrome. If you remember the allergic granulomatosis, systemic vasculitis and hyper eosinophilia, asthma and allergic rhinitis in the Sjord-Strauss. So that's what the neutrophilic palisaded granulomas derm. Alrighty. So our next slide, oh, I believe this is our last slide for today. We've gone 50 minutes. I think we're beating these to death, but it's good. We need to go over these in detail. We just don't want to flip them on 4X and you guess what it is because on the test, you're, they're going to throw you some curveballs. Right away, we see that this lesion on low power, somebody might say, Seb, and whip to the next slide, and they're doomed because they basically missed it. Um, why well, didn't think this was a Seb? I don't see any horn cysts. And I noticed this demarcation between the squamous cells and this proliferation of cells here that are somewhat polygonal in shape. And this demarcation is very important. And there are somewhat columns again. Um, and, what I do when I see something on the undersurface, I take a good look at the cells and these cells are very uh, monomorphic in appearance. I don't see uh, much nuclear pleomorphism. Mitoses are very rare. I don't see a palisade like we saw in that uh, tricholomoma. And this has a flat appearance, it's very flat. And I notice there are no hairs. So I'm thinking this might be in the volar part of the body because right away I said, I better figure out where I am because I forgot my going through my routine of figuring out where I am. So this looks like we're on the palmar surface or plantar surface. 
because we have this hyperkeratosis. I don't really see the good lamina lucidum. Um, it's always so hard to see. I can't rely on that. But I do rely on the fact that there are no adnexal structures here. <clears throat> and I look for these little holes here. And I think this might be a ductal structure. I don't see a very good cuticle. I never can find that darn cuticle that everybody talks about. I'll be honest with you, I really don't. I kind of have trouble finding that. Um, here's another little duct-like structure. So I'm thinking, could this be acrine? Um, now some people believe these may be apocrine derived. So um, they have somewhat of a poroid appearance, polygonal cells, you know, um, no, not many mitoses. So this is a poroma. It is attached to the epidermis. I don't know what else to say about it. It's pretty obvious. You have this fibrovascular stroma that's characteristic of the lesion. Don't confuse these with pyogenic granulomas. Some people will see a lot of vessels and they'll jump on a PG. Don't do that. Um, you know, usually you'll see more capillaries with uh, a pyogenic granuloma because this has too much uh, thickening of the squamoid, these sort of squamoid layers. And I'm trying to get back to what, there's some important things I need to tell you about this. And I took a little bit of a note here. Oh, the acrosyringium. They believe it's derived from the acrosyringium. I always forget that. And typically they're solitary and they're pink and red and they're ex somewhat nodular, a little bit stuck on looking, lower extremity, plantar and palmar skin. So you can have it. It doesn't always have to be on the plantar and palmar aspect because I've seen it in other parts of the body, typically on the lower extremity. Um, Ecrine poromatosis, where you see multiple lesions is rare. And um, PAS diastase, a PAS positive, and it's diastase sensitive. Eh, that never really helped me that much, and I don't use it. Um, this is somewhat circumscribed, which is important to know, especially on this edge here. You see the demarcation between the more normal and the, and the tumor, the neoplasm. It is a growth. Neoplasm doesn't necessarily mean malignant, it means growth. That's all it means is a growth. So you have the uniform basaloid cells. Sometimes you can see sebaceous areas within the tumor, pilar areas, and apocrine areas. I think I covered everything I wanted to say. And there was a rare case where they found an ecrine poloma with a radiation. Some patient got radiation near their foot and then they got a poloma. So, but it was exceedingly rare. It might've been just coincidental. Emanating from the epidermis and extending into the dermis are aggregates of bland, mon monotonous, cuboidal basaloid cells with focal ductal differentiation. No infiltrative growth uh, with a, uh, so you don't see any desmoplastic response or infiltrative growth. Because then you'd start to think about a porocarcinoma, which is very rare. If you see necrosis and mitoses and infiltrative growth, think about more of a porocarcinoma. So Paroma is a benign and nexal neoplasm with, they say, eccrine differentiation. Some people are saying there's some apocrine. Palm, sole, scalp, there's other sites. The cells are bland without nucleoli or significant mitoses. Focal nuclear enlargement of, of nucleoli are okay. And a rare mitosis here and there is fine. But overall, the uh, pattern is banal, Paroma. It's not cancer. Again, you can, there's no palisades. You wouldn't think about it. Uh, the tricholoma has the palisade. This does not. The ducts will have a cuticle, which I can never find. And you can have that thick epidermal collar. Um, the intervening stroma is vascularized, so much so that people confuse it with a PG. Melanin occasionally, uh, don't confuse it with melanoma. Oh, you wouldn't because you'd see a lot more atypia and you'd see more nesting and aggregates. Um, the diastase uh, sensitivity, that's because there's glycogen in the cells and it's PAS positive. Uh, the palm sole scalp, the distal limbs, any location, papules and nodules occasionally eroded and children, adults, all ages, you can see it. So don't worry about the age on that one. You can call it in a 15 year old. All right, it's going really slow on our last slides, our bitter, the bitter end. Got two more slides to go, so hold on. There's got to be some kind of pearl in here. All right. I don't know why it's loading so slowly. Oh, brother. It doesn't want to go. I think it was going to go over the differential. I'll go to the next slide. Uh, porocarcinoma. Um, porocarcinoma has the infiltrative border with desmoplasia, necrosis, and nuclear atypia. 
you can tell when you see a pleural carcinoma, you're going to start to think it's a squamous cell. So don't worry about missing that one. You're not going to miss that one. Um, the differential BCC will have a palisade. No intercellular bridges. BCC does not have intercellular bridges. That's how I tell squamous from basal cell, you know, the intercellular bridges. And BCCs don't have the ducts. The glomus tumor, well, I don't think I would ever confuse this with a glomus, but you, you know, you might want to think about that, the monomorphic cuboidal cells. Poroma, you could, it involves the epidermis and the dermis. Hydroacanthoma simplex, that's what's in the differential poroma. And it, you would confuse that possibly with a clonal seb, um, but sebs will have horn cysts sometimes. And with hydroacanthoma simplex, it's mostly epidermal. Dermal duct tumor is usually dermis only, but people have done millions of levels on these and they found out it connected up. And then the eccrine acrospiroma, the so-called nodular hydratinoma, that's another name for eccrine acrospiroma. Typically with those, you'll see a biphasic, you'll see two cell types, and they'll be multilobular and sometimes cystic, and then they can have clear cells too. So. So think about that, it'll be more nodular, multilobular, and the dermis and the subcunis, and it usually does not arise from the epidermis. So eccrine acro usually does not arise. That's just a general rule of thumb. But there's exceptions to every rule. All right, thanks guys. I'm gonna let you go, vray at dermpath.com, coming to you from Cockwell Dermatopathology. Have a wonderful day and have a happy holiday.